students of number theory will be familiar with the concept of modular inverses and their proof of existence using the extended Euclidean algorithm. But this isn't what this video will be about. Instead, we introduce a concept using a longer proof, but one that is visual, more insightful, and a bit abstract algebra in flavor. First, let's review what we mean by modular inverses. Modular inverses are the closest things we have to division in modular arithmetic. With rational numbers, we can think of division as multiplying by the reciprocal of a number. For example, dividing by 2 is the same thing as multiplying by 1 half. The problem is, modular arithmetic only has integers, so we can't use reciprocals which are fractions. Instead, we generalize the concept of reciprocals to inverses. The inverse of a number a is written as follows, and read as a inverse, with a defining property that a number multiplied by its inverse always equals 1. Reciprocals are one type of inverse, since for any number n, n times its reciprocal is 1. We define modular inverses in a similar way. For example, 2 times 3 is congruent to 1 mod 5, so 3 is a modular inverse of 2 mod 5. 5 times 5 is congruent to 1 mod 6, so 5 is a modular inverse of itself mod 6. Then just as division is multiplication by a reciprocal, we can think of division mod n as multiplication by a modular inverse. And although technically this isn't considered division, it's a useful comparison to have. But modular inverses are a bit stranger than your typical reciprocals, in the sense that not all numbers have modular inverses. For example, 2 has no modular inverse mod 6, because nothing multiplied by 2 is congruent to 1 mod 6. So why do some numbers have modular inverses while others don't? Well, it turns out a number has a modular inverse modulo n, if and only if it is also co-prime to n. 2 is not co-prime to 6, so it has no modular inverse mod 6. But it does have a modular inverse mod 5, because 2 is co-prime to 5. Note that the existence of modular inverses also depends on the modulus as well as the number itself, like we've just seen with 2. To show why this is true, we need a clock. I've talked about representing congruences using clocks before, but here's a review. An n-hour clock represents congruences modulo n. So a standard 12-hour clock represents congruences mod 12, whereas a 5-hour clock represents congruences mod 5. Positive numbers correspond to moving the hour hand clockwise by that many steps. And negative numbers correspond to moving counterclockwise. The position that a number lands on is its value mod n. We can think of addition as chaining together rotation. 3 plus 5 mod 4 would be moving 3 steps clockwise, followed by 5 more steps clockwise on a 4 hour clock. And just like usual, we think of multiplication as repeated addition. We first consider a seemingly unrelated scenario. Here, we have a 12-hour clock that represents congruences mod 12. We start with the hour hand pointing at 0, and then we move by taking 3 steps at a time, each time noting which number we land on. Each one of these numbers is congruent to a multiple of 3, since what we're doing is repeatedly adding 3 to itself. We see that we can land on only 4 numbers, 0, 3, 6, and 9, because after that we've cycled back to 0, and the pattern repeats. In group theory, we call the set of numbers that the multiples of 3 land on the set generated by 3, and denoted by surrounding 3 with angle brackets. We call 3 the generator of the set, since taking all multiples of 3 generates all elements in the set. If we perform this process again with different numbers, we can obtain the sets generated by other generators. For example, 5 generates the entire set of integers mod 12. Listing out all the generators and the sets they generate, we see that only the numbers co-prime to 12 generate all the unique integers mod 12, which is 0 to 11. This is no coincidence. The question we want to answer is, why? If we can answer this question, we'll have our answer as to why some numbers have modular inverses, while others don't. 
Let's take another look at the example where we took five steps at a time. We will be relying on the key fact that until we cycle back to zero again, every number that we land on will be a new number. We won't be going over why this is true since I think it's intuitive enough to be left as an exercise, but it will be explained in the description, so feel free to give it a try first and then check your answer later. Since the pattern repeats after cycling back to zero, the total number of unique numbers that we land on is just how many times we moved before cycling back to zero. To reach zero, we need the total number of steps that we take to be a multiple of 12, since taking 12 steps doesn't change our position. But we're also moving five steps at a time, so the total number of steps that we take must also be a multiple of five. Knowing this, the total number of steps taken to cycle back to zero is the minimum number of steps that is a multiple of 12, but also a multiple of five. But this is just a definition of the LCM of five and 12. Since the LCM of two numbers is their product divided by their GCD, our total number of steps becomes 12 times five divided by their GCD. But this is a total number of steps. What we want to know is how many times we moved. So we have to divide by five, which is the number of steps per move, and we end up with 12 divided by the GCD of 5 and 12. Since 5 is co-prime to 12, the GCD is 1, and our answer is 12 moves, which means 12 unique numbers. More generally, we can apply the same logic to an n-hour clock. If we take x steps at a time on an n-hour clock, then the number of unique numbers becomes n divided by GCD of x and n. In abstract algebra, we give this number a special name, the order of x. As it happens, there is another term that's also called order. The order of the set generated by x is defined as a number of unique elements in the set. But it should come as no surprise that both terms have the same name, since the order of x is the number of moves, but the number of moves also happens to be the number of unique numbers, which also happens to be the order of the group generated by x. So both have the same value. We see that for x to generate all integers mod n, we need this term to equal n. So x must be co-prime to n. Conversely, if x is co-prime to n, then x generates a set of integers mod n, since this term becomes n. Now we're ready to tackle modular inverses. If x is co-prime to n, then x is a generator of integers mod n. Hence, some multiple of x must be congruent to 1. So for some y, we have that x times y is congruent to 1 mod n, because the multiples of x generate all numbers from 0 up to n minus 1. Therefore, x has a modular inverse. On the other hand, if x has a modular inverse, then some multiple of x must land at 1. So this means that x times y is congruent to 1 mod n for some y. So multiplying that by 0 up to n minus 1, we see that xy generates all integers mod n. And clearly multiples of xy are also multiples of x, since xy itself is a multiple of x, so x must also be a generator. But we've shown that if x is a generator, then x is co-prime to n. So if x has a modular inverse, then x is co-prime to n. Combining our observations, if x is co-prime to n, then x has a modular inverse. So all numbers co-prime to n has a modular inverse. On the other hand, if x has a modular inverse, then it's co-prime to n, which means that a number that isn't co-prime to n cannot have a modular inverse. This means that the numbers which has a modular inverse mod n are exactly those numbers that are co-prime to n, nothing more and nothing less. Finally, we finish off with a bit of generalization for those who have already studied primitive roots in number theory. We first generalize the concept of generators in order to repeated multiplication instead of repeated addition. But instead of looping back to 0, we have to loop back to 1. In this multiplicative setting, the order becomes the least number of multiplications you need to do to get back to 1. Or in other words, the least exponent a such that x to the a is congruent to 1 mod n.
if x generates a set of all numbers up to n that are coprime to n, then we call them by a special but familiar name in elementary number theory, primitive roots. To generate all numbers up to n that are also coprime to n, we need the primitive root to be coprime to n and our generated set to have 5n numbers, since that's exactly the number of numbers less than n that are also coprime to n. So the order of the generated set, and hence the order of the primitive root, is 5n, which is the standard number theory definition of primitive roots. Furthermore, the core theorem that states that the powers of the primitive root are yields all numbers less than n that are coprime to n can be thought of as just a consequence of the primitive root being a generator. I am aware that the abstract algebraic concepts I've explained so far aren't exactly explained rigorously, but more of as just a taste test of the algebraic flavors in elementary number theory. In fact, I haven't even explained what a group is yet. And a lot of times when I say set, what I actually mean is group. But that wouldn't make any sense to you unless you've already had some exposure to abstract algebra, which this video is ultimately not about. Instead, I hope that this video can serve as a gateway from elementary number theory into abstract algebra, introducing some similar ideas between the two. Because these two fields are very much intertwined, both from a mathematical standpoint as well as from a historical one. 